uh, those of you who've been here, hello again. And those of you who have not, welcome to Fort Frederick State Park for our Women's History Month program called Which Though Not Provided For By Law Seems Necessary to Be uh, Women of Fort Frederick. Now, uh, for the most part, to, to give a little explanation of what this is, this is a, a program explaining kind of who the women were at the time, what their role was, and um, those, those type of things, not so much the nitty gritty of, of their life and how they dressed and do all that kind of stuff. This is more of a, a basic understanding of who they were and who they weren't. Um, because that's one of the first things that I want to I, I get into is, is who, who they weren't. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to kill off this last light so we can all see really good. Don't go to sleep on me. I'm going to leave that door open, I think. All right. So. See if this thing will move. There we go. So, uh, first thing I want to get into is the misconceptions about military women. And we have two great images here uh, of, of women of the 18th century. One is one of my, my favorites is the uh, March to Finchley over here. And you can see all kinds of women. And you can see uh, women up here in the windows and other things. And, of course, you see here these women um, being accosted by or accosting this, this young man. <coughs> Uh, one of the first misconceptions, uh, and because it's dark, you can just shout it out. What's one of the first misconceptions about 18th century women in the military? Uh, they're all prostitutes. They're all prostitutes, that's right. It's not true, but that's a misconception. And that's kind of what these two, two images in some ways perpetuate, although this isn't military, but they're definitely women of uh, low morals to be out in the streets uh, acting that way with a young man. But the march to Finchley, you have a British regiment marching through a town in England, and you have these uh, women plying their wares and um, all kinds of things. So, how do we know that? Well, here are some quotes that talk about the women who aren't truly attached to the military and that, they, that the military doesn't like about them. So, complaints of the people in the neighborhood against some women of loose, disorderly conduct. And that the soldiers have an open and decent manner frequently these same women, to the great dishonor not only to the core they belong to, but of mankind in general. That's 1753. Um, about 3 o'clock, the whole town of Sodom was pulled down and sawed on fire. There was a number of women's huts which, um, a number of women's huts which made great disturbances. So again, uh, anybody know about biblical terms, the uh, uh, Sodom and, and what happens? Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, that's right. Um, so they're saying that, that this is a, a village that is kind of popped up outside of a military encampment, and uh, it's a den of ill repute, and it had to be destroyed. Um, any woman suspected of being infected with the venereal distemper are to be sent to the hospital and to be examined. And those who are found disordered are either to be kept in the hospital till cured or turned out of camp. So if you were a woman attached to the army and you were not well, they were either going to heal you up or they were going to kick you out because they didn't want that around because that's going to cause, well, it's going to bring down the, the troop readiness, right? You can't have a bunch of sick men. Um, you'll have issues with your readiness and morale. Discipline. This is where it comes, a big thing that comes into is that the women who are part of the military are going to have to be part of the military discipline. So women that are attached to the foreign army were subject to that military discipline. Uh, Braddock mentions that he reads the articles of war to the women. Um, and some of the articles of war mention things like, you shall be shot or hung. Um, Soldiers of British service are discouraged to marry, and if they do marry, you have to get your commander's permission to do so. Again, it has to be official. For your wife to be with you in the service, it has to be approved by the military. We have to go through all the red tape. Um, women must be of good character. There's lots of accounts of them mentioning that very specifically. These women must be clean, good character women. We don't want women who are quote, loose, um, and of, of lower sorts, because they want to make sure that they can keep them kind of under, under the thumb of the, the rules of discipline. Any soldier, sutler, or woman, or any person who belongs to the army who shall be detected in stealing, plundering, or wasting of provisions shall suffer death. Now, it says suffer death. 
there's no records of a woman ever being killed by the military for any of these infractions. Typically, they would have been the rations revoked and would have been drummed out of camp and forced to leave. Um, sometimes they may not have went very far, but they would no longer be on the ration rolls, so they aren't part of the force. That's typically the biggest punishment. Women who are involved in the Army have interchangeable roles. And uh, this is where we start getting into our specific women here. Uh, August 1758, during the Forbes campaign, six women from the line were ordered to be sent to assist in the hospital. So we're talking about women of the line. Women of the line, are, are, they're referring to laundresses, the women who are working with the individual companies to launder their stuff. But now they're being sent to help in the hospital as nurses. Again, um, orders were issued to remind the commanders that six women were needed for the hospital and would be retrieved every fortnight. So what's a fortnight? Two weeks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, these orders were stated that also the Highland Pennsylvania Regiment needed to send two women each, while one was needed from the Maryland Lower County Companies respectfully, uh, respectively. So we are getting them from all the different areas to go to the hospital to assist. So we're pulling one of the Maryland women. Uh, during the Forbes campaign, the Maryland companies uh, that were involved with that, I think, had up to 10 women. Uh, Colonel uh, Bouquet ordered uh, General Wa General. Colonel Washington to order a sufficient number of women to attend as nurses at Fort Cumberland. So again, these are women who are starting out their role as washerwomen, as laundresses, but they are now being sent to the hospital to be nurses. And nurses would also serve as cooks. Now, two ways that works. One, they're a nurse in the hospital, and guess what the nurses in the hospital had to do? They had to cook for the, the patients. And also, we know here at Fort Frederick, that these women who are working here are also, and we'll get to that a little bit more in detail, are cooking for officers. So here's Maryland Assembly uh, quote, says in the subsistence account, there are charges for the provisions, for the provisions found four women to each company accounting in the whole 204 pounds, um, 173 shillings, shillings. shillings thank you. Uh, so that's for 57. So we know that there are four women in each company. At its peak, Maryland has five infantry companies during the French and Indian War, mm -hmm. typically two at Fort Frederick at any one time, uh, while the others are either out at Fort Cumberland or out patrolling the countryside. These women would go on campaign, and we'll talk about that some later. But these women are to be laundresses. And the provision account, basically what's happening is they're getting paid by the colony, but basically they're being paid in food, or they're being paid and they're taking the pay to cover the rations, which they also would do for the men. So laundresses, here's some images. Unfortunately, the camera, the projector's not super good, so we're mu missing some of the details. But one of my favorites here is uh, at Sand Pit Gate by Paul Sandby, that's from England, but that's, those are you know military kind of laundresses. And again, the kind of work that they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, I think these might be a little, uh, little saucier over here, but you can see the work that took and how it was set up at the time. Your committee begged leave to represent the Honorable House that in the Vixling account there's a charge of nine pence a day subsistence for four women for each company, which we humbly conceive is not warranted by any act of the assembly of this province. But the like or a larger number being, as we are informed, allowed in His Majesty's regular forces, we are of the opinion the charge is reasonable. So April 1758, so they, they, they're, they're, this is when they finally say, you know what, we're, this makes sense. Now, um, any of you who are volunteers and have been here before, uh, does this number mean anything to you? Nine pence. Yeah, what's nine pence a day typically? What we, Soldiers the pay. soldiers' pay, yeah, that's the same as the soldiers' pay here. So the women are getting the same things the soldiers' pay, but again, I'm pretty sure that, that most of that is going back into their rations. But there you go. But they said, hey, which is crazy. These men actually saying, you know, this is a good idea. We should, we should pay for this. Again, some more images of laundresses. This is a much earlier, but the idea of the, uh, the washing process, and so boiling and washing and hanging, and this stuff is laid out on the grass. Uh, why would we lay, anybody know why you lay your whites out on the grass? Makes them whiter. Makes them whiter, yes, yeah, natural bleaching with chlorophyll or whatever from the grass and the sun coming down, it, it, it whitens the... Yep. 
Um, and then our, our, young, our, young, our young buck here, um, blowing uh, uh, bubbles with his pipe. Um, had a conversation with a kid the other day, came and saw the little pipes and couldn't understand them. I said, well, you can blow bubbles with them. You don't have to smoke them, you can blow bubbles. <laughs> um, but again, the kind, of, the kind of scenes that you would see, uh, that's a French one, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, a good representation of, of, of laundry being done by the middling sort. So again, we know that laundresses may receive pay, rations, blankets, and shelter from the colony. Um, pay was nine pence a day, but again, it appears like it was put mainly towards their rations. Um, and again, they, they, so if they were putting their pay towards the rations, they may have been charging the soldiers individually for, for doing the laundry. Four women per company. There's usually about 100 men in a company. So that means one woman is doing laundry for about 25 men mm. on average. Now, it's not like my house where there's clothes every day. It doesn't seem like it ever stops. But when this process takes happens of laundry, it takes a while. We'll get to that too. Um, soldiers typically would pay for the laundry mending services through a stoppage in their own pay. It's kind of like robbing Peter to pay Paul. I don't know who ended up getting anything, any money in the end, because they're all taking money up from their, their wages to pay the other person. Uh, women typically would get half a soldier's daily allotment. I um, mean, if they had children, the children would get one-fourth of a soldier's daily allotment. So a soldier's daily allotment is one pound of bread, one pound of meat, a uh, pint of beans, uh, and then several other things. So a half a pound of bread, a half a pound of meat, uh, a half a pint of, of vegetables or beans, so as, as it goes down. Uh, I guess in theory, one, women smaller, I guess in their mind, and also not doing as much hard work as the soldiers. Uh, yeah, yeah. At least he's close enough, we can see my, my air quotes. I, I, they're doing a lot of work. Um, it's like our figure out there, the little kid came the other day and he was looking at him, and I said, I just want you to know something. I said, you see this lady right here? I said, she's tougher than any of us. She'd kick our butts if she was real. Mm -hmm. um, no doubt in my mind. Uh, so it says, I allowed only half the provisions to the women. So there's Fort Ligonier in 1763 during Pontiac's Rebellion. Uh, the return of number of persons belonging to each corps that draw provisions, including women and servants. So again, it, they're talking about who's, who's getting them. So women and servants are getting, getting the military ration at Fort Ligonier 58. It is believed that the Fort Lodge says, yes, so it's believed the Fort Lodge says each company shared one of the partitioned rooms at each bar end of each barracks. The beach barracks building, we understand, had four single rooms, so to speak, on the ends that were walled off from the rest of the barracks. We believe that four of those women were staying in one of those rooms together, and we have that interpreted today um, as above the kitchen because there's also a passageway from the upstairs room that would be their barracks down to the kitchen, which would be very similar to a servant setting in a home at the time that you wouldn't go through the main passage, they would be able to pass through. Plus, it would alleviate their contact with the men, a little less contact. Um, so that's what we believe is the case. It says, the number of women and children in each barracks room, oh my gosh, i got to read that, it's getting blurry. Let me find my quote here, holy moly. I do apologize for technical issues because uh, our uh, main projector went completely on us. Um, oh, I lost it. But let's see. The number of women and children in each barracks room in order to have a proper number put together and prevent the men from being uh, crowded and disturbed. Oh, this is at uh, Fort Pitt. So basically, they're saying they put the women and children in, in a room in rooms together to keep them away from the men. Uh, and then typically attached laundresses would get a blanket and um, issue them as well. So they would issue military rations and they'd get a military blanket or bedding. I mean, in Fort Frederick, I would assume that they also got barrack utensils and different things just like the men would have uh, as well. Uh, some more pictures of, of, of laundry being done. This is more of a chambermaid in a little higher up setting, but she's doing stuff, small stuff. Um, Something to note is that, that you see the washing here on a board, but it is not a it is not a washboard. It is, I mean, it, it's it's different than the scrubby boards that we see today. I did pull that slide out because it wasn't the point of this program. 
but it is a different, slightly different process than we think of. So, um, again, I talked about the garment. So laundry is not a simple task. It's going to take three days, roughly, to complete a load of laundry. Um, because first you have to mend it, then you have to soak it, then you have to wash it, then you have to dry it, and potentially iron it. So it's quite the process. It would take roughly three days. And again, it would start with having to gather wood and water and mending. Then they were sorted. The process of stain removal began, which could be done many ways. Uh, those would put water to soak overnight, boiled, washed, scrubbed, and rinsed. Those are typically rinsed three times, which included wringing out the garments by hand. And then the white clothes were blued or bleached. Um, there was no bleaching per se, at the, the bleach at the time, but bluing was used as a bleach product and also sun bleaching. Um, and then all the laundry would be starched, air dried, ironed, and folded. So it is, it's a lot harder than the laundry I do at home. I throw it all in the washing machine, put the stuff in, pull it out to the dryer, and maybe fold it. Uh, yeah, it's quite the process. I, I couldn't imagine doing this on a regular basis. Um, again, some more images of, of laundresses, a very body laundress on the left. And then here are some women doing laundry in a military sense. This is after our period, but still very, gives you a sense of what, what's, what, how it would go and how they'd be set up in a field camp or, or whatnot. Again, some recreations to give you some nice color photographs inside of the building. Our barracks could have had an indoor sort of laundry, but typically it's going to be done outside just because it's it's easier. You've got more room to dry and you've got more room for the boiling and the, the, the basins and, and things of that nature. And again, the various ways to dry clothes. You can see here where they're just, this whole field is nothing but white garments laid out here. And again, line drying as well. I think line drying in some cases you're going to see more so, I mean, I think there's some out here. You're going to see some line drying outside, but I think a lot of your indoor scenes of laundry, so you're going to see line drying inside because, well, you don't want to lay your garments on the floor. Uh, again, ironing um, of various uh, things. So it is a process, and you have to heat the iron, and um, or if it's a, this type of iron, I believe, is a box iron, so you would have heated the element and put it inside or, or put the coals or whatnot. Um, the ones we have here at the fort you have to, to, to heat up because they're just solid. So it's all a major process. So having four women to do laundry at one time for 100 guys is going to take a team to get it done. Oh, whoops, I hit the wrong button. Nurses. So in the hospital account here at Fort Frederick, we have wages paid to sundry nurses for the amount of I think the periods are in the wrong place. Um, 25 pounds, I think is what that's going to be, 12 pence, or uh, 12 shillings, uh, and 57. So we know that they're paying nurses as well. Are the nurses and the laundresses the same person? Again, could be. They could be separate as well. So these women could be double dipping, or they could be completely different individuals. And technically, technically, the nurses don't have to be female. Um, there will be some male nursing duties. Uh, the charge here of one pound, two shillings, six pence per month for nurses' wages, I think, yeah, no, um, which though not provided for by law seems necessary as the sick in the hospital must greatly uh, mm -hmm. suffer without such persons. So again, here's something that they didn't account for when they're putting all these military spending bills together and they go, wait, this is a really good idea. We need to pay these people to help with the ease their suffering. Not so much nurses. It's very hard to find good nursing pictures in the 18th century, but this is um, is uh, Bedlam in London. It's mm -hmm. a mental hospital, and these people are basically visiting. But and but I think this might actually be a nurse um, trying to deal with the with the patients. But again, um, very informal. No scrubs. No fancy nurses' outfits. Again, um, I think this is a French image, uh, probably a little later, but again, in a hospital, a country kind of hospital. Uh, so we don't know much about the nurses other than they earned uh, a decent wage. We don't know how many nurses there were. 
and again, uh, laundresses could be nurses. Men could also be nurses. Female nurses were quite common and part of the British system. Charlotte Brown, um, who was the, the matron of the hospital with Braddock, is very famous. And her, uh, she wrote all about her experiences here as, and, and in Europe as a nurse. And she too, although she was literally like the nurse in charge, the head nurse, she's hot lips, hula hand, um, <laughs> she still had to guess what? Do cook and do laundry at certain points in her, her time. So it is completely uh, interchangeable. Um, if any woman refuses to serve as a nurse in the hospital or after being there leaves it without being regularly dismissed by the order of the director, shall be struck off the provision roll, and if found afterwards in any of the camps, shall be turned out immediately. So you're being voluntold, and if you don't do it, you're out. Again, discipline. Uh, this is a, a hospital in London, uh, probably early 19th century, late 18th century, but uh, gives you a good idea what a ward room would kind of look like. Our hospital display up in the fort, we've tried to kind of mimic the layout with the shelves and the beds, except that we'd have probably two guys in the bed, and we have, have a fireplace and cooking apparatus going on. So if you see that, that's, that's, this is kind of one of the places that we got our ideas from. Rob, could you go back one slide? Um, hold on. Oh. I had a question about what was on the picture. Well, why can't I get my mouse to do anything? Each bed. I think, if you look down here, you see the curtain? Oh, okay. I think it's for to put a basically partition, sort of a curtain. partition or curtain, okay. but, they okay. but it looks like they only have it over the one. Yeah, there's not over the others. That's yeah. a semi-private room over there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't 100% know, but definitely you see the, see the, 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 just the chains, just like here, you see Yeah, it. those are curtains on that one. Yeah, I think that's just what, what it is. It's curtain for if there's a more serious issue. I, okay. I don't know. Okay. They also don't look like they're in line with the, it's almost like it looks like we just cover your, the head. I, I don't know, but yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Uh, it's a country hospital. This is a, a funny cartoon because, well, we got the dog. We got the nurse. She must be really overworked. Uh, but this also, we use this, even though it's a cartoon, we use this because see how the people are. There's multiple people in these beds. So we, we, we show two, two men sharing a nice rope bed together. Um, I should probably think about putting a curtain, but this might be in the doctor's house. Mm -hmm. So he keeps the door open and closes the curtain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, your shelf, your, your cabinet with your apothecary items and whatnot. We have that in our, uh, our surgeon's <coughs> quarters. Also, uh, I like the fact he's wearing a nice little red suit. Cooks. And the Ford account to sundry women officiating as cooks, 19 pounds, 10 shillings, um, 1757. So here is an account they're saying this is for women serving as cooks. Um, but we do know... The problem is, is I can't find the quote anymore. That's why it's not here. The Maryland Assembly refused to pay for them. They said, here's the account. This is just saying that, that this was the bill sent to them. They said, we're not paying for them because they're cooking for the officers. And officers be able to take care of themselves. Officers have paid. Correct. They, they, they've got servants. They've got Batman. They've got enslaved people. They've got their, they can pay for them. They're wealthier. Yeah. The British service nurses could serve as cooks for the hospital or other troops. And it says, all nurses were baking bread and boiling beef for the march to Mars, Charlotte Brown, June 1755. So they're getting ready to leave Cumberland, Maryland to go on the march towards the Monongahela and uh, infamy. So again, there's Charlotte Brown, the, the matron, and she's dealing with, with cooking as well. Um, some cooking images. Again, this one's a little later, but a military image. Um, I also think that if we do have women cooking for any type, maybe not the officers, but if they did any cooking for, say, particularly enlisted men, which we don't think is happening here, I think the enlisted men are helping. Carry water. You know, they're, they're getting the things that they need to, to make it happen. I think the same with the laundry. The men might be collecting some of the water and firewood, but again, that's not really the men's role because guess what? They've got to collect their own firewood. They've got to collect their own water for their own jobs, but it could be potentially... Thing. Here's this uh, inside of a kitchen. Um, I forget what she's making um, exactly, but again, an idea of kind of what, what a kitchen setup would look like inside. Uh, some more, again, a little earlier time for us, but uh, I always love this one because she's wearing a blue apron. Um, 
this is just the story of a blue Dutch apron here, and that's why our wall on her south there is a blue apron. Uh, but the thing she's using, the, uh, the reflector oven, the rotisserie reflector, um, and just the, the ideas of things you might find or how it would be set up um, when they're working in a, in a kitchen. Uh, I don't see any cats, I don't see any birds, except for the fat one. <laughs> uh, again, now this is a tavern scene, but again, you get an idea of, of these are the kind of things that we use when we're doing our interpretation of how do you set up plates, how do you do different things in the background. There's my bird, and I think there's a cat in this one somewhere. Um, but it, to give us an idea of what life was like, because we can't, we have to fill in a lot of the gaps. We have bare bones information, and so we use these types of things, these period documents and images, to help us create a sense of what the 18th century may have looked like here. Women in the field. Yes, these women go in the field. Six women per company are allowed to each of the two regiments and independence companies four. Uh, um, and independent companies, four women to each company of carpenters, Virginians, and no, sorry. Women to each of the companies of Carpenters, Virginians, Marylanders, five. Artillery, two. All right, yeah, and two for the troops of light horse, yeah. So here, this is during uh, Braddock's campaign, how many women would have been with each unit on the march. Uh, typically, these women are going to be marching at least at the rear of their own units, if not the rear of the army, uh, which is not a very good place to be uh, during that campaign. And then let's see, the Maryland Company's returns between August 26th and September 11th, 1758, while camped at Raystown, a.k.a. Bedford, Pennsylvania, that they had 10 women assigned to the four companies uh, present. Five women for the Maryland Rangers in Braddock's campaign. That seems like a lot, because weren't there only 50 Maryland Rangers? Yeah. I don't know. Six per company. An independent company. I, I wonder if, <coughs> no, to each company. That's what I was trying to figure out. Did they mean for Virginia and Maryland both? Both together, five. But the people that were in the Beretta campaign in 1758. Uh, so women in the field, so to speak. Uh, this is a detail from a Morier image. It's a woman diapering a baby. Uh, the dog is enjoying getting a sniff. <laughs> um, right outside of the tent is, is cooking. Um, so, again, in the field, in a tent. Uh, this is a laundress, um, sort of a, 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 a city kind of situation where she's going around. But again, she's got everything on her back, much as, a, as a, probably they would have at the time. They might not have carried all that stuff on their backs during the Braddock campaign, but it gives you an idea of a kind of a stout. Uh, women and, and what kind of load and burden they could could carry. Uh, again, a little more fancy because I think these are officers, but women in the field in a camp in what 1780 at the camp at Hyde Park. But again, trying to find good field images. This is the kind of thing we have to go to sometimes. Uh, I like this, and this is kind of interesting. I realize that this is a cutaway. You can they kind of cut it away so you can see her doing. The laundry at this encampment, um, and again, more settled areas. I mean, you got pretty significant tintage over here and tables, but still, out in the field, uh, not in a fixed fortification uh, kind of situation, and, and what they would would need and use. Same thing, laundry in the field. Again, another English encampment. Uh, very similar to the previous picture that I think I showed, but this one's just not in color. Uh, although I'm pretty sure she is the wife of one of the prisoners, I don't think it really matters. I think it still gives you, invokes what we're looking at. She's got her burden on her back. She's carrying a baby, dog following her. You know, she's, she's walking along just like the soldiers and the, the prisoners are doing here in the 1740s in the highlands of Scotland. Uh, again, what we're looking at, it's, it's not all uh, uh, proper tea parties and whatnot. Uh, about 11 in the morning, the French Indians attacked our baggage on the march in the rear and scalped a soldier and a woman. So again, Braddock's campaign. So we're rear of the column, women are getting attacked. And going over the river, there was an Indian shot, and there was an Indian shot, one of our 
women and began to scalp her, her husband being a little before her shot the Indian dead. So it sounds like if they were married, in these cases, they, the men were marching with their wives, but it's not safe. It's definitely dangerous. Um, here at the fort, we know that they paid sundry persons for, or various persons were paid for clothing of all sorts, bedding, haversacks, and haversacks with soldiers, so we know that women are engaged, maybe not so much here at the fort per se, but are engaged in making clothing uh, regionally for the troops, and there's some pictures of some women sewing. Um, notice the disinterested husband. Uh, he's, he's really upset that he can't watch Sunday football. Um, but yeah, but again, we also know the laundresses are going to be doing um, some sewing activities as well. And then some other things that women could do were doing, they were cleaning, definitely cleaning their own, own spaces and helping probably clean the hospital and different things. We also know that sometimes women were involved in uh, farming activities. And it says the women uh, to turn out to uh, cut splits and to... Uh, and those who refuse to are going to be thrown out, basically. But basically, they're saying they need to come out and help gather in the, the, the harvest or plant the harvest or whatever. And um, so these things happen. That's, again, 1763 at Fort Pitt, but again, regionally uh, meaningful. We know at Fort Frederick there was a sutler. We know the sutler was a man. But that doesn't mean to say that there weren't other petty sutlers um, that were women around or traveling through. So women serving as sutlers selling uh, extra rations and things that the men might need to supplement their, their diets is possible. Uh, I also have some period images of a milkmaid and a fishmonger. Again, sort of sutler style things. These are women who are selling uh, the certain thing like milk or, or, or fish and again, how they kind of looked. Uh, I definitely wouldn't want to meet the fishmonger in a dark alley. She, she looks mad all the time. <laughs> and again, they're kind of comical. So they're a little bit stereotyped. I mean, the milkmaid looks like an innocent little maid, and the fishmonger looks kind of ticked off the world. I guess if I had to carry fish around all day. <laughs> yeah. Sutlers. No women's, no what soldier's wife is to subtle or sell liquor without the major's leave on pain of imprisonment, and leave will only be obtained for such as are particularly recommended by the captain or commanding officers of the company. So they can do it, but they've got to get permission. No one was to be a petty sutler in the camp without proper authority on pain of being struck off the provision rolls. Followers of the army, any who are known to sell liquor that intoxicate the men are forthwith to be dismissed. You are subject to military discipline so long as you enjoy the benefits of this license. So that's, a, that's, that's, the, that's the, um, the fine print on a sutler license at Fort Pitt. Uh, so again, women can do these things, but there are rules. And if you break the rules, you're out. So kind of in summation, who are the women at Fort Frederick? The honest answer is we don't know. They could be wives, maybe. They could be daughters. Maybe. Adventurous women, more than likely. Women down on their luck, probably, just like the soldiers were. Um, they could be all those things. But we know that they're working class women. We know they are virtuous, at least to a sense. Virtuous enough to follow the rules. We know that they're clean, and we know they're darn well they're tough. They aren't officers' wives. They aren't ladies. And when I say ladies, I mean women of an upper class. And they aren't prostitutes is if they were prostitutes, they'd be gone. So we don't know their names. We don't know who they were exactly. But we know these things for sure, and potentially those things as well. And unfortunately, we don't, we don't know. We'll never probably know who they were. But we're happy to know that they existed, and in somewhat what numbers they existed. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a neat thing. And it's a story we like to tell. Um, I'm really excited that this year our interpreter staff is going to include two female interpreters who are going to help tell these stories more so than, than um, my male staff has done in the past and myself. Um, so we're really excited about that. So let me make sure, I'm pretty sure that's the last slide. Yes it is. I'm going to slowly turn on the lights.
I'm trying not to blind anybody. <laughs> well, we'll we'll start with that for a minute because it's it's hard on me too. Any questions? Any comments? Observations? Jerry? Uh, did you mention that women would go on patrols? So I don't know if they were going on active patrol, but they're definitely going on campaign. So they're marching with Braddock's army. Okay. They're marching with Forbes' army. I think any time a large body of troops is going to be gone for a period of time, they're going. But are they going on like a regular Routine. average patrol? Routine. Probably not. Okay. Yes? In a lot of the pictures you had dogs, almost every one. Do you have any idea how many dogs were at Fort Frederick? <laughs> 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 Um, so I don't know how many dogs there were, if there were any, I'm sure there probably were a few. Uh, there were probably dogs here when Governor Sharp was here because he has pictures of him with, or there's a painting of him with his dogs, or gray, like greyhounds or something. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there were dogs about, I'm sure there were cats about. Uh, we've always said we should have a fort cat to help keep the mice down. Yeah, there you go. Um, I don't know how you keep a cat in the fort, but we've, we've thought about it. It stays near the food. I was going to say, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Anything else? Well, I appreciate everybody coming out today uh, for the program and for the other things that we've done. Um, I'm available to answer any questions you might have or comments one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And uh, otherwise, have a super rest of your weekend. <laughs>